our strength and song. Highest praise to Him belongs. Christ the Lord, our conquering King. Your name we raise, your child sing. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. And by His hand we stand in victory. And by His name we overcome. Though the storms of hell pursue, in darkest night we worship You. You divide the raging sea from death to life. You safely lead. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. And by His hand we stand in victory. And by His name we overcome. standing give somebody nearby a hug say hello let them know how glad you are to see him today let's just take a moment and greet Thank you. Hey, are we going to stand again for the first song, the next, the second song? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. The reason I'm asking him that is because our normal worship leader, Lincoln Smith, is out of town today. He and Amy are taking a much needed vacation. And our abnormal worship leader this morning is Brad Bass. So. Hey, if you're a guest, welcome to Twickenham. We are honored that you chose to be with us today. Uh, and, and, and we mean that. Uh, You've got a lot of places you could be today. Uh, a lot of different churches you could have attended and you chose to be here, and we're thankful for that. There's a card in the seat uh, back right in front of you. you can fill that out and give us a record of your attendance today. If you have a prayer request, indicate that on the card, and we will, we'll be praying about that uh, tomorrow and all through the week. Uh, if you have questions about anything that's said or done today, I, we would love to talk with you. That Not, not that we are the answer people. In fact, we, we have a lot of questions too, but we'd love to engage in the conversation with you about anything that um, you, you sing or hear said or symbolized in our service today. We hope it all will lead you to the throne and, and bring you closer to God, but sometimes it raises questions too. So we're certainly open to that. Love to have a conversation with you. If you're looking for a church home, we are looking for new people to join us on our journey. And we're not, we don't have it all figured out, but we're, we're trying to. Just glad you're here. Let's stand, uh, and we're going to sing some more. Let me share a scripture with you here uh, as we continue our worship. This is from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in a God who is able to bring justice and mercy to all. And he promises strength for the journey, for the steadfast to answer the call. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in the truth of the Bible, in its power and purpose today. There is meaning and life in its pages. We believe and we choose to obey. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe that he's calling his people to embody his story of grace, bringing rescue and hope to the broken. May our lives be an offering of praise. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. And though we cannot see, we still believe, let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful, let us be faithful. And though we cannot see, we still believe, let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful. Seated, please. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. 
May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. lights up for me. It's, an, it's such an honor to be here today, and I thank you so much for this opportunity, but the honor is really talking to the Lord. So would you bow with me, please, as we pray to God. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We are so blessed, Lord. You've given us this opportunity to praise you, because we know without you none of this is possible. Lord, we're so grateful for all you've done for us. You've given us this opportunity to get together on Sunday to praise you. You have given us so much, Lord. And sometimes we take it for granted, but we know without you, none of this is possible. We're so grateful that you've given us our lives, Lord. We're so grateful for our families. We are truly blessed, Lord. We ask that you be with us, Lord. Help us to be strong. Help us to grow the church and, and help us to be better Christians. Lord, we are blessed with the team here at Twickenham. They are so strong, and they help us to get even stronger. And we're so grateful for them, Lord. We're also so grateful for our soldiers who are out fighting for our country, our missionaries who are preaching your word in sometimes hostile environments. We're so grateful for all you've done for us, Lord. We ask that you be with everybody, the soldiers and the missionaries, and we get them back home safely, Lord. We're so grateful for the opportunity you've given us as Christians to tell your word to other people, Lord, because we know that's our purpose here on this planet, is to spread the word. Help us to be strong, Lord. Help us not to be shy. Help us to be vocal when we express your word, Lord. We're so grateful for all you've done for us. Lord, we ask that you be with our sick, both physically, mentally, and spiritually, Lord, and we ask that you help them to recover, help their bodies, their minds, and their spirits to come all back to them so they can be whole, and they can be back with this church, which is us, Lord. We love you so much, and we are so grateful for all you've done. We ask a special help for our country, Lord, for our politicians, Lord. We ask that you be with those who are God-fearing, who love you, Lord. Help them to be stronger so we can all, as a unit, get our country back, Lord, because we love you so much, and we love the United States, Lord. Please be with us, Lord. Help us to be strong. Help us to go forward here and spread your word. Help us be the Christians you want us to be. Because we are so grateful for your son who died on the cross. Help us, Lord, to be worthy of that sacrifice. Please be with us this day, Lord. And forgive us of our sins, because we love you so much. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's take our offering this morning. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the Cause our eyes to see 
ago we uh, recently celebrated Easter and interestingly enough this weekend is actually uh, the Jewish Passover weekend um, I say that because uh, in thinking about that it's uh, kind of given me a focus this week on uh, Jesus in, in the garden sp scene specifically um, I, me personally I have a tendency of of losing uh, the fact uh, that while he was here, he was truly human. There were things that he really struggled with, um, you know, tempta the temptations. Uh, and uh, I, I just have this tendency of always putting him here as, as God, which he is. Uh, but I, I don't realize 
um, sometimes how human he really was, which gives me a picture, uh, or gives us a picture, I think, in the garden scene um, with a couple of prayers that he had. Um, recently, I learned in Israel uh, that um, the Jewish people uh, look at the, the prayer from Hannah as a prayer of, or an example of how to pray to God. It's an intimate pouring out of their heart um, to, to the Father. And uh, that is one of the examples that they use in teaching prayer. And I say that because I want to specifically deal with the two prayers that we have from Jesus in the garden. Uh, the first one, Matthew 26. And in Matthew 26, we get a, a scene here where he, he has a time of prayer and then he comes back to his apostles to his apostles, his disciples, they're asleep. And he says, wake up. You know, the time is near. You guys need to be praying so that we don't fall into temptation. Um, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And to me, I, I understand that he's trying to, to talk to them about, you know, their, their willingness, right? But I also think it's showing us an intimate sign of him really struggling with this reality of what he's about to go through. This cross that's... Uh, before him uh, the reason why he's sweating blood is because his his uh, spirit is willing but his flesh is weak he's struggling with this decision and um, so uh, the the other prayer fascin fascinatingly to me is um, the one that we just read a, a section of in John which is the unity prayer so we get this glimpse of Jesus in the garden sweating blood, concerned as a human, pouring out his, his, his innermost being to God, asking for the cup to be passed, but not my will, your will, submitting to, to the Father. And instead of negotiating, um, how can I get out of this, he's praying for the unity of his disciples and his future followers. So I want to read a passage from Philippians chapter 2. And as we think about this morning um, what he did for us so many years ago, um, the fact that his, his, in his intimate moment there, his focus was on our unification. And, and I feel like Philippians 2 really gives us a good example of how, how to reach that goal. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count himself equal to God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let us pray. Father, it is so uh, humbling to be before you and realizing that um, one of the greatest gifts that we can give you is our heart and submitting that and becoming humble. And Father, that that the only way that we, we can unify is to strive to follow in the footsteps of your son, Jesus. As we take this bread, I just pray that uh, uh, you help us remember who he was, what he suffered, but also the fact that he was resurrected on that third day, the hope that we have in him. And um, it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people. Thanking you for this cup that represents your son's blood. The fact that uh, you see this cup, uh, that this cup covers our filthy rags that we have and washes us white as, as snow. Father, we just thank you for uh, your son's willingness to uh, do this on our behalf. And it's in his name that we pray. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body.
Here's the cool thing about Sunday mornings at Twickenham. If you walk in the door, you're in the band, okay? That's it. So, and you did a great job. That's awesome. Hey, we want to welcome some uh, new folks here. Uh, well, we actually welcomed them last week, but they weren't here. <laughs> Brandon and Lauren Howard. They were actually home, and they were watching online. She is almost ready to have twins, two girls, uh, Claire and McKenna, and their son is Auden. So we want to pray for Auden, because he's going to have... Two little sisters. I, 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 can you guys just wave? Because I know it's kind of hard to stand right now. So anyway, welcome them. Give them a hand. We're glad to have them. 
And welcome back to our students. We missed you guys last week, some of you. Glad you're back, though. So. <laughs> hey, let's look in Ephesians chapter 4, okay? We're in a series right now called Identity, ID. And it's about who we really are in Jesus. And we're working our way through the book of Ephesians. I'm kind of excited to come to this passage today. This is the, the first sermon that I preached here. Um, so it was kind of, well, not the first one. The first one was the tryout sermon, but none of us remember that. So, because we were all nervous. But the first official sermon was this one, which is kind of cool. This is a, a great passage for us to look at. And I, what I want to do is just uh, read the passage and to get it in front of us, and we'll, then we'll pray over it, and then we're just going to walk back through it and look at some things in here that it has to teach us. Okay, nothing fancy. We're just going to try and study the Word here for a little bit. So Ephesians chapter 4, I'll begin in verse 1, and I'll read down to verse 16. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That's why it says when he ascended, I think I didn't include this part on the screen, but we're going to go ahead and read it anyway. Um, that's why it says that when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So we pick up on the screen now at verse 11. So, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's pray over this. God, thank you for your, your, your powerful word here. This word on unity, this word on mission, this word on grace. And we pray for clarity of insight. We pray that we'll understand what's going on here and what you're trying to tell us. We're so thankful for your servant, Paul, for the church in Ephesus, and for the fact that so many years ago, you set apart, set about a mission, and that we are the beneficiaries of that mission. Bless us as we hear and learn your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Paul starts um, this section of the letter here in chapter 4 uh, with an unusual, almost off-the-cuff comment as a prisoner of the Lord. That, the reason that's unusual is because incarceration is not exactly a resume enhancing feature of one's professional portfolio. I mean, it's, it's, it's not now, and it certainly wasn't back then. It was even worse back then. Apparently, Paul's identity is not wrapped up in his circumstances. I really think he's making a faith statement here. We, we usually think that Christ is present only in holy places or holy moments, Sunday church, weddings, funerals. Paul experienced that presence in a prison, which I think suggests that you and I could find Christ's presence at school or at work or in the neighborhood. 
or at the ballpark or in a troubled marriage. We associate Christ's power not only with holy spaces and times, but with, succeed, with seasons of success and abundance. So if we're on top, or if the good guys are winning, then we think those must be Jesus moments. But Paul experienced the power and presence of Christ in prison. And you can experience Christ's power and presence in a hospital corridor, or a courthouse, or at the rehab center, or at a halfway house. Christ is, Christ is present not just in the good times, but in the bad times too, when, when we're on the bottom or we're in the middle, in prosperity or in poverty, in sickness and in health. So Paul begins by saying, as, as somebody who has experienced Christ's power and presence through tough circumstances, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. A couple of important observations here. This is the first time in the letter that Paul has focused on our behavior. Up until now, all he's wanted to talk about is what God has done, not what we have to do. I mean, seriously, the only imperative, the only command that he has so far issued came back in chapter 2, verse 11, when he said, remember. And that's not exactly what I would call an onerous command, right? Remember, that's not hard to do. Everything else was about God's work on our behalf, not our responsibility to him, which I think comes as a little bit of a surprise to a lot of people, because a lot of folks think that the Bible is just one long list of do's and don'ts. They think that it's a, just a gigantic rule book. There are do's and don'ts. There are, there are rules and laws. But huge tracts of biblical territory are devoted to who God is and what God has done for us. Half the book of Ephesians, even over half of the book of Ephesians, is, is about God's work for us, not God's rules for us. The, the second important thing here is to note that our, our ethics, our behavior, is always a response, not an initiative. That w when we choose to do good, that's a response, not an initiative. Our conduct is the smoke, not the fire. W we live a worthy life because of the calling we have received. We don't receive the call because we lived a worthy life. That's why it's one of the reasons it's useless to tell people who do not believe in God what God wants them to do. And that probably sounds a little odd, doesn't it? Let me say it again. It's useless to tell people who do not know what God has done to live by his laws until they realize the cost of the sacrifice, how high and wide and long and deep is the love he has for us, the only rationale they have for obedience is fear, and fear is a very low-octane fuel. Now, Paul's rhetoric is driven by his theology. You tell people what God has done before you tell them what to do. But he does get around to telling us what to do. He tells us to live a life worthy of the call we, we received. Now, what's that? What is the call we have received? Is he talking about the call that, you know, they say preachers get, or is it something else? Well, it's the stuff we've been talking about the last two weeks from Ephesians chapter 3, the call to be messengers to the world who demonstrate and communicate to the world what God has done in Jesus Christ, how through the cross... Jesus has dealt with our sins once and for all, how he has torn down the wall that separates people from God and people from each other and created a new humanity. He has given us a new identity, and it's one that's not defined by words like Jew and Gentile. It's an identity not defined by words like black and white or Asian and Hispanic or rich and poor, and God calls that new identity church, a group of people who strive to live like and look like Jesus. And Paul basically says, we're supposed to take that message to infinity and beyond. Now, if the book of Ephesians were a musical, with all this talk about mission and calling and living a life worthy of the Lord, you'd, Paul would just break out in song right after verse 1. 
and it, it, it would be something like onward Christian soldiers or soldiers of Christ arise or rise up, O men of God, kind of an old good old hut two, three, four song. But that's not what he does. What he does seems more like something you'd hear at Woodstock. Like all we are saying is give peace a chance. Paul starts with what Stan Mast calls the small virtues. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Humility was not a real popular virtue in first century Greek and Roman culture. Everybody back then lived like they were running for elected office. They constantly touted their credentials and talked about why everybody else was not up to snuff. They celebrated their successes and celebrated your failure. They minimized their inadequacies and maximized yours. Humility was and is hard. It's hard to be humble. You have to admit that you're not the center of the universe. I don't know about you, but from where I'm standing, everything is happening all around me. I must be in the center. It's hard to be humble. And then Paul says, gentleness, be gentle. That wasn't very common back then either. Back then, if you couldn't convince somebody to agree with you through your persuasive rhetoric, you could always use force. It's hard to be gentle these days, too, for the same reason. Because in order to be gentle, in order to have gentleness, you have to renounce violence and manipulation and control. And then patience. Patience has never been a popular virtue. Patience requires a wide soul, one that endures annoyances. I hate patience. I hate it. You've got to have this wide soul that endures annoyances and delays. I'm a big fan of Margaret Thatcher, and I really like what she said one time, the Iron Lady of Britain. She said, I am extraordinarily patient, provided I get my way in the end. <laughs> but here's why patience is hard. Patience is hard because in order to have it, you have to rid yourself of the tyranny of your own agenda. That's hard. Now, I like the last virtue he mentions in verse 2, bearing with one another in love. I like that one. There's actually some good news here. The good news is that there are going to be people in your church that you don't like, and that's okay. People in your church you don't like, and that's okay. Here's the bad news, but you have to put up with them. I mean, why else would Paul say bear with one another in love if you're never going to encounter somebody in church that you don't particularly like? The, the bad news is that you and I have to put up with those people. We may not like them, but we do have to love them. And here's the thing, they have to put up with us too. Okay? And I can tell you about some of you, that's hard. And I'm not going to call any names, but he's on vacation today. So anyway. <laughs> Verse 3. Paul tells us why these virtues are so important. We, we need these virtues because that's what we use to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's, the, that's what it takes to, to keep the unity. A couple of things about the unity here. First, I mentioned this the, the first time we, we looked at this a year ago. That unity is not something we have to forge. It's something we have to keep. God has already united us. Our job is to stay that way. Second, I don't think Paul is talking about some kind of organizational, institutional unity. Okay? If you think about it, they didn't, the church really wasn't an organization when he wrote those words. It wasn't institutionalized. It wasn't an institution. What I mean is I don't think Paul is, is telling us that we have to find a way to somehow unite with the Southern Baptist Convention or the Presbyterian Church in America. In some ways, I think we're already making the effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace as we work side by side with other believers through ministries like Prepare and Respond, PAR. That's our, our, our ministry to help people that have been, uh, whose homes have been damaged, 
lives have been damaged in something like a tornado or a flood. We have a, a group of guys that go out and, and with, with, they're good with chainsaws and with heavy equipment and they go open roads and help people rebuild their houses. We work with the, the Rock, another church in town, not a church of Christ, and other churches that are affiliated with this program. We go out and, and we, we help with that. Uh, Huntsville Inner City Learning Center is another example. The, the, the Lincoln Village, Downtown Rescue Mission. Unity has more to do with how we respect believers who have been shaped by, by perspectives different than ours than whether we agree on what Sunday worship ought to look like. If your unity is based on what happens one hour of one day a week, it is going to be a really fragile unity. If your unity is, is, is based even on, on agreement on a list of propositions, it's going to be a fragile unity. There's a 40-mile stretch of road not far from here that's populated by over 20 little churches, all bearing the name Church of Christ. My guess is that not only could they not agree on the issues, they couldn't even agree on what issues ought to be on the list. Now, Paul provides a list verses 4 through 6, but I don't think he intends this to be a litmus test for unity. I think what he mentions in verse 4 through 6, what's commonly known as the seven ones, I think, I think he's just saying unity is logical. Here's why. There's one body and one spirit, and you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's over all and through all and in all. In other words, in Christ, we all make up one body. We are filled with the same spirit. We live toward the same hope. We serve the same Lord. We appropriate God's free gift the same way, by faith. We're all born into the church through the same sacrament, baptism. And all of us, regardless of age, race, ethnic origin, nationality, social position, color, skin color, are children of the same Father. We're all the same before God and because of God. But, in verse 7, there's a but. We're all the same, but we're not. We're different. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. We, we encountered this facet of grace a couple of weeks ago when we looked at chapter 3, verse 7. Remember what Paul says in chapter 3, verse 7, I became a servant because of God's grace. God's grace made Paul a servant. It made him a prisoner. God's grace saved Paul from a lot of misery, but it gave him a mission. It saved him from eternal pain, but it gave him a purpose. God's grace delivered Paul from judgment, but it gave Paul a job. Grace is, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, is not just a get out of hell free card. It, it not only frees us from something, but it frees us for something. It delivers us from eternal separation from God, and grace puts us to work serving and showing others the boundless riches found in Christ. We sang about this a minute ago. We believe he is calling us to embody his story of grace. We sang that. Grace isn't just limited to God's unmerited favor. It isn't limited to, to us just getting what we need instead of what we deserve. Grace is a call to serve as much as it is God cutting us some slack. Here's the thing, and I think this is what Paul is saying there in verse 7. All of us are touched by the grace of God, but we're touched differently. We all belong to the same body, but the members have different functions. Now, he really unpacks this in a lot more detail in Romans and in 1 Corinthians, both Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but the lesson is clear enough right here in verses 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. The job of leaders in the church is to equip the members of the church to discern and deploy their unique abilities in works of service, both to the church and to the world. My job, in part, is to help you serve one another and serve this community. Now, can I just be, I want to be really honest with you here. Can we do that? I don't think I've ever heard a minister 
or an elder or a church leader admit this out loud to a church. But a year ago, when you and I started this journey, we, we started together by being really open and honest. So let's keep it up. Okay, here's the thing I'm going to admit. We church leaders don't always do a very good job of equipping God's people to do the work of service. I mean, this is an area where, where church leaders in almost every church tend to really drop the ball. And, and, and I'll tell you, we do it a lot, but I'll also tell you it's a lot harder than, than you think to equip God's people to do the work of service. For, let me just give you three quick reasons, not excuses, just telling you why it's, we don't do a good job with this. For one thing, and you, I want you to think about how it is at your work, okay? For one thing, it is a lot easier to do a thing that you know how to do than it is to teach somebody else to do the thing. Now, it is tons easy. If you come to me and say, I want you to teach a class, I go, okay, I can do that. But if you come to me and you say, I want you to teach some people how to teach a class, I'm going to have to spend some time on that. That's because that's hard. So it, 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 it's, it's just kind of hard to do. You think about your work. If there's a thing that you know how to do at work, I bet there are times when you find it a lot easier just to go get the thing done than it is to train somebody else to do the thing. Now, I would also say that another reason that sometimes ministers and elders don't do a really good job of equipping you to do the work of service is because some of us are control freaks. I'm not. <laughs> but some of us are. Of course, when I was 15, they took my kidney, uh, my, uh, that was 10 when they took my kidney out. When I was 15, they took my appendix out. And by the age of 15, I, I'd asked them to give me a localized anesthetic so I could oversee the procedure just to be sure they did it right. So. <laughs> But I'm not a control freak or anything. Uh, so that, that's a, w there's, there's that factor, too. For another thing, now here's another one. Most church leaders are keenly aware of how busy you are. You have a job. You have kids. You have a home to keep up. You have kids. You got a marriage to maintain. You have kids. So it, it, it's real easy to feel bad about inviting somebody to do some work, some work of service when you already know they're slammed, and then there's the selfish side of it, okay? I said I was being honest. Here's the selfish side. If I do a work of service that blesses you, you feel good about me. You affirm me. You write me notes, and you say, you are awesome. I love to get notes that say, you are awesome. I have a whole drawer of notes full of, you are awesome. I feel valued and needed and wanted, and then I feel good about me. So sometimes, that's why ministers and elders tend to do all the work themselves instead of equipping you to do the work. I'm just trying to be honest with you and admit that we don't always do a good job of that. I can tell you this. We are aware of that, and we are working on it here at Twickenham in some very specific ways. And I think this fall, you're going to see some dramatic improvement in, in, in that regard. In the meantime, if you are, I'm going to talk to everybody who is already doing a work of service and is involved. If you are involved in ministry right now, if you are doing a work of service that you know how to do, would you tap somebody on the shoulder and invite them to join you? If, you? if you're doing something right now, working in our children's ministry, working in our technology, whatever, what, if you're doing anything, working at Lincoln Village or the Huntsville Inner City Learning Center or PAR or whatever it is you're doing, tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, come join me in this, okay? If, if you are not involved in something and you want to be, give us a call at the church office. Let's talk about where you would like to serve. And if you're not involved in anything right now and you don't want to get involved in any work of service, would you please come forward while together we stand and sing? <laughs> Do 
Because not responding to the grace of God through serving the body and the community is not an option. We've been talking about this for weeks now. This is not church. This is Sunday worship. You can call it Sunday church, I guess, if you want to. But, But church is us. And doing church, worshiping God, is when we are out serving. We serve each other here, we serve our community, and we do that because of the grace of God. The grace of God not only saves us from our sin, but it sends us out to work. That's our response to what God has done, and not responding to that is not an option. Paul says that when we take the the grace God has given us and we put it to work serving the body, a bunch of really great things begin to happen. In verse 15, he says, we grow up. In verse 14, he says, we're less susceptible to false teaching. In verse 13, he says, we become mature. In verse 12, he says, the body of Christ is built up and we reach unity. You know, here's a funny thing. When you got a church full of people who are all working and serving, they don't have time to fuss. You got a church full of people that are just looking to get served, they're going to fuss. So one way to to land on the same runway we took off from, one way to really keep the unity is to be sure that we are vigorously, actively serving. Not because we're good, not because we're smart, not because we're talented. We serve because God has given us grace, and we want to give that grace to others, and we serve out of that. Our service is smoke. The grace is the fire. Let's have a prayer, then we're going to stand and sing. Holy Father, we love you. What a great passage you give us here. Awesome passage. Father, we pray for wisdom as we seek to apply it. We pray that we will be a very busy, active group of people, not wearing ourselves out, but working out of the energy that you so richly give us not trying to win your approval like we could ever do that by being good, but by responding to the grace you have given us by serving others and thereby saying thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for this marvelous grace, God, grace that delivers us from judgment and gives us a job. We love you. We pray that we will make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in this place. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ.
pray together. Father, we praise your name as creator of the universe, and we thank you so much, Father, that we can be here this morning for this, for this worship service. We thank you for Jody's message. We thank you for your love for each of us. We thank you, Father, for the unity that exists here in this church at Twickenham. We ask you, to Father, to, to be with each of us as we endeavor to, to be of service, to listen to your calling, uh, to be active in, in your kingdom. We pray for the sick, Father. We pray for those who are grieving, who are suffering disruptions of any kind. We pray for all of us, Father, that hope will be stronger than despair. We ask you to watch over us in the week ahead. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs> 